How many of you remember or are aware of a folk group from the 1960s called Peter, Paul, and Mary? Anybody remember them? Peter, Paul, and Mary. They were quite popular in the 1960s and they had a lot of very salient lyrics. Well, with a name like Peter, Paul, and Mary, it sounds like, you know, three figures from the early church, doesn't it? Paul, after all the fame that they experienced, felt an emptiness in his soul. So, he thought, I'm going to go to the most spiritual-natured singer at the time and ask for his advice as to what to do. And that happened to be another singer by the name of Bob Dylan. You remember Bob Dylan? Yes. So, Paul Stokey goes to meet Bob Dylan, tells him about this emptiness in his soul, and he asked, what should I do? And Bob said, you need to do two things. The first is, go visit your old high school, walk through the halls of the high school, and remember your dreams. What you were hoping to be as you grew up. Then the second thing he advised them to do, pick up the Bible and read the New Testament. Start reading it. And that's what Paul did. He began reading the scriptures, visited the high school, and he said he was carrying the, the Bible around with him and it was as though he had a friend. Well, of course, Jesus said, I call you my friends, for I've made known to you all that the Father has told me. So he was beginning to develop, to develop a relationship with Jesus. One night, he, Peter, Paul, and Mary were performing at a concert in Austin, Texas. And after the concert, a young man came to talk to him after, backstage, and he was talking to him about Jesus. And so they realized they shared a friendship with Jesus, and so the young man asked if he could pray with him. And after he prayed with Paul, this is what Paul said. Wow. I started to pray, and I asked Jesus to take over my life. And then I started to cry. And he started to cry. And that night, the grace of God entered into the soul of Paul in a remarkable way. What was the difference? He had been reading the scriptures, but with the word of God must come prayer. And when you put that together, knowledge and prayer then the Holy Spirit takes over and you will begin to be like St. James. The second reading today. James is the can do, just do it saint. Okay? St. James talks about action. Putting your life, what you receive from the Lord, into action tells us not to judge people, right? Tells us to control our tongue. The kind of things that my mother taught us as we were growing up. Well, think about the people in the gospel after Isaiah prophesied that when the Messiah would come, they're going to experience, don't be afraid, because the Lord's going to open your ears, and then you're going to proclaim the glory of God. What happens? when the Messiah arrives and they bring him this deaf man who was also mute. When he touches the man, notice he takes him away from the crowd. The crowd represents the craziness of the world, right? Crowds. Beware of crowds, right? He takes him aside. Jesus very compassionately prays with him privately and he puts his hand on him. It's like he's recreating this man and his tongue and the man now for the first time hears and now he's able to proclaim the glory of God. Who does that man represent? All of us, when we don't listen to the word of God. We're like deaf. Why? Because we're listening to all the influencers in the world, the crowd, 
to what they have to say instead of listening to Jesus himself. While we were talking this summer in those six weeks where we looked at John chapter 6 about the importance of preparing yourself to receive the word. Read the word before you get here. Or if you haven't done it, at least when you get to church, open the missalette, read the word, and then put it all down, put your machines down, put everything away, and let it be proclaimed because the second time, Jesus is going to touch your heart. Like he touched the heart of that man. First, the ear has to be open to the word of God. Today, the eighth day of September, we celebrate the birthday of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Nobody was open to the word better than Mary, right? We know that at the Annunciation. She had been raised with Isaiah and Jeremiah, all the prophets, the Psalms, raised with the word of God. And now the angel of the Lord announces to her, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And then explains, you have a mission. You're going to be the mother of God. Whoa, this is frightening to Mary. Don't be afraid, he says, just like Isaiah prophesied. Don't be afraid. With God, all things are possible, right? So Mary says, well, let it be done to me as you say. That's her extraordinary trust in God. I'm going to trust, let it be done to me. In other words, thy will be done. Mary's already teaching it before Jesus teaches us the Lord's Prayer. Now, I want you to then fast forward to John at the Last Supper. St. John, at the Last Supper, the way they had their seating, they did not have dinner tables the way we have in our homes. Okay? They were down on the ground and they had something like a low coffee table, all right, for their meal. And so they're all lying one against the head of the next. It was John who had his head on the heart of Jesus. He is the perfect disciple. What does disciple mean? A listener. What was he listening to? The heart beat of Jesus. Literally. Did you know before doctors had stethoscopes, that's how they checked your heart. They put their ear on your heart. And then eventually they developed a little cup and then they developed the stethoscope. But think, most, most of history, they didn't have all of the technology we have. And so for thousands of years, the doctor put his ear on your heart. Right on your chest. That's what we're called to do. Listen. Because Jesus is going to reveal his heart to you if you listen to his word. And you'll be transformed into a true disciple like John, the beloved disciple. Do you get it? Now let's look at another disciple. Let's really fast forward to our own modern time. A woman who died just a few decades ago. She grew up in Albania, Eastern Europe. Occupied by atheists, the Soviet bloc. Terrible, terrible time in history there. Persecuting Christians. She felt called to enter a religious community as a young Catholic girl and she entered the Sisters of Loretto. Some of you have relatives that were actually educated by Sisters of Loretto in Santa Fe. The Sisters ran a school, right? Loretto Academy. It's now the Loretto Hotel. And that chapel that is there, which is absolutely stunning, where the Sister, Mother Superior, called for a carpenter to build them a wonderful little spiral staircase because they failed to do that when they designed it. In those days, what they would do is they'd throw down a rope ladder so that the choir members, imagine that, had to climb the rope ladder to get into the choir. The Mother Superior said, that's not going to work for our students. The girls in those days wore long dresses. Can you imagine that? Going up the rope ladder. No, we need a staircase. So anyway, Mysteriously, a man showed up, built this incredible staircase. The architects and the engineers cannot understand how it stands. It's a miraculous staircase. No question about it. Study it. You will see. 
and they did a novena to St. Joseph. So they believe St. Joseph either came himself or he sent an angel because once it was completed, he never at, they never saw him again, never got paid, went to the lumber yard, couldn't find out where he got the wood. The wood studied, it's like wood in the Middle East, from trees in the Middle East. Incredible, right? Now I just went down into a little arroyo. Let me get back on to the subject. <laughs> the woman I was talking about is named Sister Teresa, okay? Sister Teresa is trained in Ireland. She had to learn English, of course. And then they sent her to the largest English-speaking country in the world, which is India, right? A billion people who speak English. That's where they sent her to teach in a Catholic school, a Loretto school. But she had to keep her ear opened God's message because he had another job for her. After teaching years in this Catholic school, doing great work, Sister Teresa hears a call from the Lord. I need you to leave the convent. You're going to start a new one. What? This is what she got on her retreat. Leave this convent. You're going to start a new one and a new order. There she was in that fine Catholic Cal school in Calcutta. She leaves the convent. She gets only one young woman to work with her and they form a new order, you know them, the Missionaries of Charity. From those two, handling the most abandoned people on the streets, and they had a lot of pushback because the local people said, don't touch them, it's their karma. They're getting what they deserve, it's their karma. And mother would just smile, no arguments, pick them up and take them to her house for the dying and give them love and dignity in Jesus Christ. And that order now has thousands of members all over the world because one woman listened to Jesus and said, let it be done to me according to your word. I had the privilege of an encounter with Mother Teresa when I was a seminarian in Rome. She came to our seminary. She had been visiting Pope John Paul. They were very close and spoke to us. We were 200 students in our chapel, theologians, scholars, we were all, you know, pretty heady with the word of God and theology and so forth. And here comes this little, I call her a pint-sized nun. She was no, about this tall. Very, very small woman. Now when she entered our chapel, you could hear a pin drop. She got to the ambo, spoke to us, she didn't have any books. She didn't have the Bible in her hand. She spoke directly from her heart. Because here's a woman that had a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with Jesus. And basically what she said to us was, love Jesus and you will love his people. Pithy, wisdom, and what a powerful message. I'm going to give you a few of the quotes that I've kept that I love from Mother Teresa. Here's one. She said, the most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unloved. Now here's from a woman who lived in one of the most abject poverty-stricken cities in the world, Calcutta, people literally dying in the street and left there. She said, the real poverty is being unloved. Here's another one. She said, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. If you judge people, you have no time to love them. Here's one. I have found the paradox that if you love until it hurts, there can be no more hurt, but only more love. She said, I think today the world is upside down. I think she's quite right. It is suffering so much because there is so very little love in the home and in family life. We have no time for our children. Everybody seems to be in such a terrible rush, anxious for greater developments and greater riches and so on, so that children 
have little time for their parents. Parents have little time for each other. And in the home begins the disruption of the peace of the world. In the home begins the disruption of the peace of the world. Yesterday I was at a conference with scientists and policymakers and theologians about peace. And you see the drama in our world as war seems to increase. We've got to start in the home. That's where it starts. We pray for the, ch the world to change, but we've got to act in our hearts, in our families, and in our homes. Here's another one I love. St. Teresa of Calcutta said, words which do not give the light of Christ increase the darkness. The words which we speak that do not give the light of Christ increase the darkness. The way my mother taught us was, if you have nothing good to say, don't say anything. Can you hold your tongue and pray for wisdom? It's not easy to do. Words which do not give the light of Christ increase the darkness. Finally, St. Teresa said this, at the end of our lives, we will not be judged by how many diplomas we have received, how much money we have made, or how many great things we have done. We will be judged by, I was hungry, and you gave me to eat.